In today's ultra-competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Hey, I'm the real Jason Duncan and welcome to another edition of the Root of All Success podcast. I got a great guest for today's episode, but we're jo- if you if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that we're right here in the Matador room at the Standard of the Smith House in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. If you don't watch these on YouTube, I want to encourage you to do that. And of course, these all go out on on uh, all the podcast players. You know, Stitcher is my favorite, but iTunes and Spotify, anything you can listen to it anywhere. But uh, if you want to watch it, you get a sense that you get to see the guests, you get to see me, see the room that we're in. It's a really, really cool place. If you ever get to Nashville, you need to come come look up the standard. It's a private club. It's 18,000 square feet of Southern sophistication and style owned and operated by the one and only Joshua Sterling Smith. I'm privileged to be a member here at the club. It's one of the top five cigar clubs in the country. It's one of the top steakhouses in the country. It's a great place to come and hang out. And, uh, and have events. And here at the club, when we record these, sometimes the guests will want to smoke a cigar or have a glass of bourbon or whiskey or something. And today, my guests and I are going to be enjoying a little Guidance Whiskey. Who's a, a, It's a Nashville whiskey brand here. So I'm actually sipping on a what we call a guidance tea. So it's kind of like a, it's a fruit tea with some guidance whiskey in it. So you may hear our glasses clinking a little bit if you're not watching this on uh, on YouTube, but we're very honored to be here at The Standard. I'm also honored to have this uh, this podcast produced by Potitize, one of the world's leading podcast production companies. And then also C, uh, C-Suite Radio Network is our syndication network, which allows us to get syndicated and to hundreds of thousands of opportunities for people to listen to us all over the world. So I'm very honored, and I thank you for being here. Thank you for being a, being a loyal listener to the podcast. If you have not gone to iTunes or any of the other uh, review places where you listen to this and leave us a review, that would certainly mean a lot to me. So thank you for doing that. I know every podcast guy says that, but I'm, I'm really saying thank you for doing that. If you go and leave me a review, it would be very, very much appreciated. So thank you for doing that. So I want to talk about our episode sponsor for today. Our episode sponsor for today is Nurture 360, and that's N-E-R-C-H-E-R 360. So if you're a sales leader or a company owner, you're probably fed up with the CRM that you're using now. I know most are. Uh, CRM's got way too much to deal with, too many bells and whistles that you don't need. It's very complicated. It's cumbersome. You have to go hunt for data. You still got to produce reports for your team meetings, and it's all just way too much. Well, until now. Nurture 360 and the guys over there have developed this platform that is absolutely designed for the sales leader or the company owner to see at one glance everything that's going on all throughout the sales pipeline, all the projects that are being managed. It's all in one place with no manipulation of data. It's all right there. As a matter of fact, when I sat down with the owner of the company, uh, the first time I sat down with him, he was kind of wanting my advice as a business coach on some of the ways that he had developed it. And I said, dude, this is fantastic. I want to use this in my companies. So I brought it into, I use it now in three, I guess three of the companies that I own. And it is phenomenal. And if you want to take a chance and try or trial rather and take a look at it, go to nurture360.com slash root as in root of all success. And that's N-E-R-C-H-E-R 360.com slash root. And you'll get a special offer to try the software. And I promise you, you're going to like it. It's so much better than all those huge CRMs that we buy and they were just too cumbersome. So, so go give it a shot. I think you're going to like it a lot. Tell them that we sent you nurture360.com slash root. All right, all that, let's get onto the show. So let me tell you a little bit about my guest. So today's guest got his start early uh, as an entrepreneur in the second grade selling mistletoe in a little red wagon. <laughs> I don't know how 
how much better the story can get from there, but it does. So he did that, and then he was uh, also selling gum at the roller skating rink when he was in middle school. I can remember doing it. I didn't sell gum at the roller skating rink, but I still have my skates. I love going to the roller skating rink. Uh, he also, uh, when he was in high school, had a lawn mowing business, and he even helped his dad repair pressure washers. And I think he was even telling me that he had a fireworks stand at one point somewhere in that story. And uh, we'll have to ask him a little bit about the fireworks stand. But not wanting to work for his dad, he went out and started his own power washing business. And that business is called Steam Away Mobile Power Wash. And he focuses on fleet washing, and he's been very successful at that. And uh, that weekend work that he was doing through college allowed him to get through uh, college in six years, got an accounting degree, and he moved out into his first house without any college debt, which... I think all of us uh, probably have experienced something, whether we've either had the debt or our kids have it. <laughs> we, we know how big that is, but he did that by being an entrepreneur. He didn't have that college debt. So today uh, he's got mobile fleet washing. He's got that, that job that, or that business. He's got a uh, kitchen exhaust cleaner, environmental power washing specialist, a power wash educator. And he's based out of Fort Worth, Texas, where he lives with his wife of 11 years. And we're glad to have him in Nashville today. And according to him, the biggest mistake he sees that business owners make going into any business, specifically the businesses that he's in, is that they don't seek management training. They, they don't understand how important it is for time management and how to manage money and how to manage employees and all that's crucial to success as a business. So here we are today. We got a Fort Worth, Texas guy right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Excited to have him on the show. And uh, Michael Henderleiter. Thank you for being here, man. All the way from Fort Worth, flew in today, and we're glad that you're here. So thank you for being here, man. Yes, sir. Thanks for asking me on. I appreciate it. Well, so cheers. So you're drinking a little uh, Coke and Guidance whiskey, and I got a little uh, standard tea. So cheers to you. So it sounds like that, based on your bio, you know, entrepreneurship has been in your blood since the second grade. Yeah. Is that the way you see it? I, yeah, I would say so. And I was very fortunate to have a father that recognized that and encouraged it. So well, how did he recognize? It? I mean, a second grade, how old are you? Seven? It's like, like this kid's going to build yeah. a business one day. What did he see in you? I, you know, I think, um, what would, when I went out to do the lawn mowing business, he told me for every lawn, no matter how many lawns I got, he would buy all the gas for me so I could make a better profit. Ooh. And then when I decided I wanted to go start a power washing business, he told me if I could get, if I could get enough work, whatever that number was, I don't remember, in the first month of business, he would give me the little cold water power washer that I had. So it was just encouragement to go do it. Oh, my gosh. Is, is, yeah. dad, is your dad still with you? He yeah. Uh -huh. He's still alive. Yeah. So what's he think about all the, the success that you've experienced now? Is he like, hey, you need to buy me something now? <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. He, he, he often comments about how proud he is about the things that I've done. And he, uh, the thing that... that I kind of surprises me the most because he was always such a hard worker and a hard, very aggressive entrepreneur is that he, he'll, he'll see the things that I'm doing. He goes, I just don't know how you have the time to do all the stuff you're doing. And, uh, I, I guess at some point, if you've got a good coach and a good mentor, you outgrow them because you learn everything that they had. And then you just find ways to become better at what they teach you. That is so true, man. I remember, I remember having that awkward conversation with one of my early mentors and our business coach. We had a coach at the time, and I remember that conver that conversation and, and my coach making that comment because my mentor had brought me in, and we had, and so I had. It was kind of that same thing. It's like okay, at some point, all entrepreneurs are going to outgrow their mentor. You know, the, st the student becomes a teacher, and I, so your dad is that guy. Like I taught you all this, but yeah. how are you doing this? This yeah. is crazy. You know what? Interesting thing. Uh, interesting thing you mentioned, Michael, is that. Um, your dad says he doesn't understand how, how you have the time to do all this stuff. My wife says that to me a lot too, cause I've got, you've got several businesses, which we're going to dig into and I, I own multiple companies too. And it's, um, for me, it's just normal like that. The way I do business every day and I got lots of balls in the air, plates spinning, whatever analogy you want to use, you sound like the same kind of guy, but people who are not in it, the entrepreneur, the people who don't have that don't see it. So how, what do you say to them? Like, I don't know when they say, I don't think you have the, how do you have the time? What? How do you respond? What, how do you explain it to me? I haven't figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> a lot of times say, well, I don't know, but it's hard. <laughs> you know, it, it is, <clears throat> there is a difficulty and a challenge to it. Um, but it's, it does come down to a lot of time management, deciding what's important and, and figuring out how to prioritize it. And 
I frequently probably go through my goals and things I want to achieve and look at what I'm getting the most impact out of my time for. And there are things that low become low priority because I don't get enough impact to return back on those things. So I kind of move them off and try to find someone else to do them. So what, uh, where did you learn that? Like, where did that concept finally or, or originally hit you? It wasn't, it wasn't something that someone said to me. It was me realizing that I was so overwhelmed and every time I would try to grow or do something, I would try to learn it all myself. And as I got it to a point where I could train someone else, I would hand it off. And then as I grew, I, be, I started growing too much and had too much on my plate. And then I, had to, then I had to start learning to trust people to take some of the things that I wanted to grow into that I couldn't do personally and then delegate it to them and let them run with it and then kind of coach them on the process. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what I hear you saying is that this concept of how time management is so important to you and how you figure that out because it is hard is it, it wasn't as much taught as it was just a realization over time. And you were like, okay, if I did this, then this happened. So it's almost like trial and error, figuring out, okay, when I have too many things to do and I don't manage it correctly, failure ensues. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I may digress a little bit, so fix, fix it if I don't, okay. if I do. But <clears throat> I actually had this conversation this morning about I was at my 10 year mark. I started getting all these letters and phone calls from consultants that wanted to come in and tell me how to run my business better. And I assume because I hit that 10 year mark that this is where the gravy spot is for these consultants. And this was golly. So that would have been like 25 years ago when I was 10 years in business. So this consultant came in, he went through his process and they, they interviewed me and my staff. And he sat back down and just regurgitated everything that I told him I needed help with. And my first thought was like, I know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you want $80,000 to tell me what I already know to help me do it better. Um, and you could ask me that at the beginning, I'd tell you what I need help with. But the thing that really stuck in my craw and got me motivated was that I had an accounting degree and he said to me, after he did the analysis and what I was making based on what I was working in the company is that you could go get in a job as an accountant and make pretty close or better than what you're doing now, spending 80, you know, plus hours a week in your business. And you would be doing it like 40 to $50 or 50 hours a week. And, um, he said, now you could probably do what I could get you trained up to and doing within six months to a year, probably take you anywhere from three to five years. And all he did was put a fire under me. And I said, Nope, I'm not doing the contract, but I'm going to do this. And I'm going to figure out how to start managing myself better and making my company more profitable. So at the time I'm actually investing in it is worth the return because that really upset me to think that I worked that hard and I could go work for an accounting firm and make exactly the same. Wow. It wasn't it. It felt like I would wasted the last 10 years. So, uh, so I don't want to pour salt in the wound, but did you pay the guy anything or did, or was it kind of a, an initial engagement to see? Cause you didn't hire him. No, I didn't hire him. And it, it was such a long time ago. I, I think there was some type of incentive there that if you like whatever I paid, I would get it back in the overall right. payment somehow. Um, and I just decided, I, I, if I recall right, whatever it was, I decided it wasn't worth going forward, and I would take the loss. But I learned enough from experience that it was worth spending it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at as as someone who does what that guy does. So I'm trying to, yeah. I, 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 like, what he told you that day changed your life. And I don't it know. Did. What, I don't know whatever you paid him yeah. to do that initial part, but yeah. just knowing that thing. So many entrepreneurs are blind to that. They, they create jobs for themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and you've done that for a decade. And oh, I, I love did, that. Term. I did kind of the same. They created a job for themselves and it takes an outside person to come in and say, Hey dude, you know, you could be making as much money half the time working for the man and have low, no stress and go to sleep fine. Uh, but, but what he told you changed your life. Now you didn't need, you didn't need his engagement to make the rest of that happen. You did it on your, your own 25 years later. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. <laughs> it's going real good. Uh, 
And, and, and not to take away from what you had just said about doing the, the consulting, because, you know, for, for a guy that's only doing a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to want to pay someone $80,000, it didn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, that's a big chunk to take down. Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't, and he didn't sell himself right. You know, what was the return on that? So. Well, so you got started as an entrepreneur early. Dad, it sounds like dad was a very key person in your life to, to build into you. I am not just going to give you an allowance, but I'm going to, I will buy your gas or I'll give you the power washer if you do these things and if you can make these things happen. So he, he is a very important, pivotal person in your life. You did the chewing gum thing, the mistletoe, all that. I love that. Nobody's ever said, I got my start in the mistletoe business, <laughs> <laughs> but but you did all these things, but but I think when we were talking pre-show, you said the fireworks stand was one of the most exciting things you did. You want to tell a little bit about that? Oh yeah, I I absolutely loved it because I just love fireworks. And when I was growing up, I was the the kid on the block that would have an hour to two hour fireworks show, and several of my neighbors wouldn't buy fireworks because they knew Michael was going to do this <laughs> great fireworks show. He'd go buy them all. So. Um, me and uh, some friends had, had gone to the lake for the weekend. We were driving back and saw a fireworks stand, and he just happened to mention, yeah, my, uh, my cousin did that, and they made so much money. I was like, what? So, you know, I started checking into where we could get wholesale fireworks and, and how to build a stand, and I did all the regulations. And this was the season was about two days out, and... I, I got a hold of the wholesale firework company. They gave me the, the regulation book. I went, I had a minimum of $250 to buy it. And I went and bought the wood to start building the stand. And it took me, I think, a day or a day and a half to build the stand. I can remember my neighbor stopping by the stand saying, he goes, man, I drove to work one morning and saw you over there working. And that next night I came back and you had, you had virtually a whole stand finished out. <laughs> he goes, I've never seen someone your age work like that. So, you know, it's, it was just the drive. And, and then when I got the fireworks, I felt like, because when I'd always go to the fireworks stand from the consumer's point of view, I wanted to know what everything did. And I can remember going to stands where they had techs that didn't know anything. And so you're trying to buy stuff to show off and have fun. Of course, me having a little pyromania in me, I, you know, I wanted to know that stuff. So I, I lit everything and I figured out what items performed well for a low cost? And it, it, even if it wasn't good profit margin for me, that's what I drove all my customers to. And I got such a loyal following over two or three years that it was, it was, it was unreal how many people would come back to my fireworks stand just because they knew I would treat them right and give them a good bang for their, bang for their <laughs> bang buck. For the buck. Yeah. I got to see what you did there. <laughs> So how, like, I'm curious just on the money side, how much can one make on a fireworks stand for, for July season? You know, the, the markup is ridiculous. Uh, it has to be. Yeah, it's, it's, well, so when you see, oh, first off, I'll say the buy one, get one freeze is they always either double or triple their price. Uh -huh. So I went at it as discount fireworks. And I, for the most part, I did a minimum of doubling my prices. But what, what, and the industry's changed a little bit, but as you go up on the higher ticket items, they kind of come down. Like they're only like maybe half markup and stuff, but the low ticket items will be anywhere from two to 300 times what I say to like, if it's a buck, it could be like three bucks yeah. what you're selling them for. So, and a lot of people are buying those low price items anyway. So it was, it, for me being a college kid, I could make Anywhere from, I think the first season I made like $6,000 and then it got to be like fifteen dollars to $20,000 a season I could make just running one stand. Wow. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was nice. So, so nobody is sitting in, sat in that chair on the other side of the microphone who's done uh, fireworks or mistletoe. So, <laughs> but you know what else? Nobody sat on the other side that's done power washing either. I've, I've had people on the show that have done, you know, landscaping-ish things or uh, and I've got people that have been in the jewelry business and people that have been in land development, but, but power washing, you know, it's a very blue collar thing, you know, power washing, fleet washing, like to, to build a business that is doing as much revenue as what you're doing. I think people are going to be very interested to hear how you did that. So you've been doing this, the power, the power washing, the mobile fleet washing for 35, is it 35 years? 35 years. Yeah. 30. I mean, people don't stay in business that long, but 35 years. 
how you got started. I don't have to ask the question. You got started because dad, 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 you know, power washing was kind of in your blood through the teenage years. You started right out of college. So now, or in, or while you were in high school. And right out of high school. Yeah. yeah right. Out well, of I school. actually was in high school. When you started. Yeah, because you didn't look old enough to be out of college 35 yeah, years. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I was a senior yeah, when I started. Okay. Yeah. Well, so so how let's, – let's do this. So the, so the concept of the show is this. It's the root of all success. So I, I want to talk to successful entrepreneurs who are doing at least $10 million in their business, and you know, they're, they've built a business on their own without the help of a family business or franchise, generally speaking. So if we're talking about success, I want to dig into that with you in a minute, Michael. But let's start with this. What, in your opinion, what's the definition of success? Like, how do you define it to people? I, you know, that's changed for me over time because I think I've become better at understanding what drives me as a person and what I feel like my purpose is. And as, as a young man, I was driven to, to run and grow my business, to be successful, um, and to build my equity, so to speak, so that I could have a family and I could have kids and that kind of stuff. And, but I don't think everyone ever really understands that mind process or that thought process of purpose. And though I, though I knew that's why I was doing it, I really didn't see that, that that was my purpose. I saw it as like, hey, I got to do this business. I got to make money. I got to be profitable. And so I focused on that instead of realizing that I was actually doing those things so I could be a, a good providing husband and, and father when the time came to get married. So, um, and I like to pass that message on because I, I think a lot of young people don't realize that that's where they're at. And it even... I think a lot of young people don't realize that until they have a child and now they have someone to provide for and take care of that their whole life changes and their purpose driven to take care and make sure that that person has a good life, um, whether theirs was good or not, but then purpose steps in mm -hmm. and it didn't happen for me by having a child. I knew that at an early age that I always wanted to do that. And so I was driven from that. And so success to me means, being able to provide those things and have a good uh, family and happy kids and things like that, that's success to me. And these are all tools to achieve having that type of success. So with that in mind, do you consider yourself to be a successful person? I do, yeah. Love it. I love the confidence. Yeah. That's good. Well, when I ask that, I ask that question of every guest, you know, how, what's your definition of success? And I follow it up with, you know, do you consider yourself successful? And I get... You know, half the time people are like, well, kind of, and here's why. And then other people like you go, absolutely. But I think the answers come to, to out of the same spirit because really success is about achieving the results that you intended. Like if you wanted to have a good family and provide for your kids and, you the, the, yeah, that's your definition of success and you've done it, yeah, I'm successful. But if your definition is of success is I need $100 million in the bank and you, you're only at 90 Okay, well, you might consider yourself not successful yet, but right. you're on the way. So the spirit yeah. of that success, all of us are aiming for the, for something different, and it changes. Like you said when I first asked you, uh, it's kind of changed over time. So now let's, if you don't mind, I want to dig into this. Now, so the, so the kind of the background of the, the, the ethos of this show is that, you know, over the years that I've been an entrepreneur, I have uh, spent a lot of time – you know, over, over a cigar or a glass of bourbon or something casually over dinner, asking very successful entrepreneurs that I have the pleasure to be in their presence, I'd ask them, well, so how did you do it? Like, how did you become successful? You know, I'm trying to be successful like you. How did you do it? And as I, Michael, as I asked that question dozens and dozens of times, I found the same five things popped up in every single story, almost without exception. And where it didn't pop up, if I ever went back and asked them about that one thing that was missing, they would go, oh yeah, that too. <laughs> so, it's, so it's always, so my, my thesis is that there are five indisputable keys of success. And I use this show as a way to dig those and just test my theory to see if it's in fact right. And it starts with, I call them the five P's of success because I all start with the letter P because I used to be a pastor and you make everything a letter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to make it all start with the same letter, but that helps you remember it. So the first P of success is passion. So I want to ask you about your passion and where that played into building a uh, mobile fleet washing and kitchen exhaust cleaner and all this to $10 million or more in revenue. Like that's a big deal. 
how did you do it and did passion play a part? So before I let you answer that, um, the definition of passion has kind of two facets. So on one hand, you've got the emotional side. I think that's what most people think about. I'm excited. You know, I'm joyful. I love it. You know, that's what passion. But really, passion comes down to a mental state of willing to suffer. Like the, the, the word passion, if you look at it in the etymology of the word, it means willing to suffer or willing to endure. Like, and I always use this as an example. Um, when Jesus went to the cross, we, we refer to that as the passion of the Christ, right? Well, it wasn't because he was excited. It always bothered me, like, why are they call it the passion? He didn't seem happy at all. But it was because he was willing to endure. So for entrepreneurs, what I found is that their success always started with their willingness to suffer through the crap because it is tough oh, yeah. and hard. And they push through and push through and push through. Whether or not they like their business is one thing, but being willing to push through. So my question for you is, where did passion play a part in leading you to 35 years of unbelievable success in these very blue collar concepts of power washing and exhaust cleaning? And like, how, how does that, how did passion play a part of your story? Well, I, I think it goes back to purpose to begin with is, is being able to endure and go through all that, the passion of trying to achieve that, to make that goal happen was, um, let me rephrase my thought. So being able to, the passion was driven by wanting to achieve my purpose. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So that's where it started from. But I would say that there are different levels of passion, if you want, if you want to look at it from that perspective, meaning that, you know, one, as... As the companies grew, I had to change my, my focus and understand what needed to happen to get to the next year's goal or the one that I wanted to, that was 10 years from now. And like when I was in high school and, and my plan to go to college, knowing that I was going to pay for college was, hey, I can't sleep late on, on the, the weekend mornings to go up and go wash fleets and I need to get out there before it gets super hot and try to get as much done while it's cool before I completely just like fade out mm -hmm. from the heat in Texas when it gets up to 100, 110 degrees. And so that's, that would drive me because I'm like, hey, I, I need to be able to fund my college. I need to be able to pay for my truck. And so I would think on those end goals and constantly focus on those end goals, even though it may not have been where I needed to be 10 years or 15 years from now, even though that's, I know that's where I wanted to go. But I have to, I kept it small, and where it was in in chunks and blocks that I can manage. So, I I, I got to ask this question. So, power washing fleets is sounds very hard. I mean, not not mentally because I mean it's it's pressure washing the mud and dirt off of a vehicle. So there's not a lot of math in that or accounting. Yeah, <laughs> which right. Yeah. Agree. But but there's not a lot of it's not very sexy. So did, was there ever a time you're like, I absolutely love this. This is the most amazing thing in the world. Or was it more of uh, hey, I got a purpose and I'll wash as many trucks as it takes. <laughs> no, you now, now, because I'm going to, I really enjoy this response and I'm fixing to give you. And that is, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can find something in that, that you like. No matter, like, like washing trucks, I mean, you're out there in the heat, it's blowing back on you, you're getting soap on, you're grimy, you're nasty, but you can find something about the day that's enjoyable. So when you get done and you look back at a clean fleet, like, man, that looks good, I did a good job. You know, I'm happy with what I did. And so that's, that's enjoyable. Or, um, or getting to employ my little brother and make, you know, and, and encourage him and do things like that. That's what was good about the day. The fact that I'm washing trucks is not anything that I really factually enjoyed or liked. I mean, it gets old, it gets monotonous and becomes a, a pain in the butt or, um, or then just thinking about, okay, how can I make this job better? What can I do to be better at this job and get joy from that? So that's, you, you know, yeah, it's just, it's kind of, and, and every situation in life, you can do that. Um, let me digress a little. You can, do what you want with this. But one of the things that I, I kind of fall back on is, um, and I, the story may be wrong, but I think the facts are pretty close. 
when Senator John McCain, and there's been other people that this has happened to that were prisoners of war, they, um, they created a, a reality in their mind to deal with the situation they were in. And that really stuck with me because, um, you know, he was, he was put in a parrot perch, if you know what that is, where he tied his arms behind his back and they hold you with your full body weight from your wrist with a rope. So you're suspended in the air or close to it. And his, el his shoulders became black and blue and they had permanent damage in there. And that's why he's always kind of like this and he couldn't really move his arms right um, because of the damage from that. But through the process, and I could be confusing stories with John McCain's, it created a reality of, of thinking about like living at home or living outside of where his body actually was. And it did that practice every day. Um, <clears throat> and so it stuck with me that people have the ability, not only that, well, they can find themselves being prisoners of their own mind, of their own thoughts. So uh, with that, I, I began to try to, to focus on how can I do things to make me a happier person and be happy about the situation I'm in, even though it may not be a happy situation, how can I, how can I get through this moment to take me to the next stage of my life? Mm -hmm. Well, that's really, that's a very interesting and appropriate illustration, Michael. So um, for the people that are listening, you know, that illustrates the concept of passion. You know, nobody, and there, there's gonna be things that you're, you're going to not enjoy. And no entrepreneur who expects to be able to enjoy his or her venture 100% of the time, every one of those people are going to be disappointed because there are going to be times you don't like it. But if you, I love what you said. It's about purpose. And I think that's kind of the thing I hear in you. I can sense it in your spirit is that there's a greater purpose behind building these companies because getting out there in a hot summer sun in Fort Worth, Texas and washing trucks is not fun like there there are probably fun times uh, uh, but like at the end of the day eight hours of doing that but the purpose behind building those businesses that's where passion is like you're willing to endure and willing because you know your wife deserves it your kids deserve it your neighbors deserve it your brother you know all the people that you've got that are depending upon you deserve that so i love i love that passion and purpose and how those play into your success so the next level that I found is that, and, and a lot of times these next two P's kind of go together, and that's being at the right place at the right time and on the right people. So people in place are kind of those next two. So I think based on what I heard in your story originally and read your bio and then introducing you now and talking a little bit about it, is that your dad has to be one of the people that led you to where you are successful, but he's probably not the only one. There are probably others, but who, who are the people and where was the right place at the right time that made Michael the, get the successful entrepreneur that he is today? Yeah, well, obviously my dad was for sure. And then I think that my grandfather was a good, on my mom's side. Um, my dad had a farming background. So there, you know, a lot of, a lot of farmers are very self sufficient, and motivated and they get things done you know they, they find yeah. ways to get that done where on the other hand on my mom's side the very blue collar family and my grandfather had worked in factories and looked for that pension and all that and he thought i was crazy for being an entrepreneur and told me he actually told me that it was going to make me die young because of all the stress and worry i'd been through <laughs> and and there, there there are times he, he's passed away but there are very 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 well, there's several times that I wish you could see how successful I am today, and and he, he would know that uh, how 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 good my life has become, and I'm sure you can see that. But well, <laughs> but that's kind of where that is. Well, on on the on the on the dad side, can I can I ask a question about that? So your dad was a farmer. He he grew up in the. His farm. dad was a farmer. Yeah. So what was it about? What, why did your dad? Uh, fixed pressure washers. What was it? Why did he need them? Was there something he was doing with them? He, well, he had he, he'd gone to college and he had an a engineering degree in, in aeronautics and went to work for Cessna and Boeing and done that. And he, I think he had told me that he had tried to start like a union thing at one point and that didn't happen. And so he knew the writing was on the wall that he would no longer be employed and he would be blackballed in the industry. So he began looking at opportunities in different entrepreneurial driven businesses. And him and my mom found 
learned about power washing, which was in its very infancy at that time. The, the pumps that they use today are called piston pumps, you know, triplex, three, three plungers. And those weren't really in existence at that time. They used what it was being used in the oil and gas industry and said they had to use a crane to put them in the back of the truck. And they did 30 to 40 gallons a minute at maybe six to 800 PSI. So it was high volume at low pressure that they cleaned with. And so you're just dumping all this water out there compared to what they do today. But that's, that's what they did. They found that business and he worked weekends for free for a guy to teach him under the preface that the guy got free labor and he would move to a market that did not compete with that guy. And it, they chose Dallas and Fort Worth because I, weekend work, and I would assume the guy was doing a lot of fleet washing. Yeah. And Dallas and Fort Worth intersects with a north and south corridor and an east to west corridor, two freeways that intersect there in DFW. And so that's why they chose it for all the uh, transportation industry that would be there. Well, there's your right place, right time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, exactly. So your dad, so this is what's interesting too about the story when I find about people's success. And you, you may or may not have ever thought about it this deeply because it's your dad. You probably not thought, but the fact that he failed at the union thing forced him to do something that he would have never done otherwise, yeah. and it led you to sit across the table from me. Yeah, that's like, true. Isn't that weird? <laughs> that is. But the, and see, that that's the illustration of these five P's is that you can't control all of them. Like a passion, you can't make yourself love something, but you can will yourself to endure. So passion, you can kind of control, but be, knowing the right people, knowing being in the right place at the right time, you know, those are things that you can't specifically control, but you have influence over. Like you're here today, and as much as I would love to tell the audience that you flew in just to record this, you're not here just for me. You came for an event. You're here in Nashville today yeah. for an event, but you're coming here and rubbing elbows with people that can elevate your business to the next level. And I think that entrepreneurs need to hear that. It's like, look, bad things can happen, like to your dad. But those can put you in places that you would have never been able to do or, or experience otherwise. And you, you're a fruit of a bad situation, but turned out to be absolutely phenomenal for you and your family. Yes. I love yeah, that. Absolutely. I don't know if you've ever thought about yeah. it that way. No, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It, and it's very true. And my dad didn't tell me that story about the union till maybe four or five years ago. Oh, wow. So... I mean, <laughs> it's a point of pain for him. It, well, it, ex, with the exception of my mom, I don't even know how many people know this story. So, <laughs> well, a whole lot of people know. Now. Yeah, they will now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, that's a long time ago. And yeah. today, we can sit across the table, and people can listen to this on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher and watch it on YouTube, and they can listen and hear the encouragement of, "Hey, this situation happened. Your dad ended up doing the power washer thing, and now here you sit." doing amazing revenue on an annual basis because of that, where your grandfather would, is very proud of you now, where, where he is looking down. But, you know, we can, we, we can see the fruit of all this stuff, even though it, it was bad at the time, but, man, it turned out spectacularly for yeah. you. Well, that leads me then quite naturally into the fourth P, which is preparation. So you got passion, you got being place, you know, being the right place at the right time. You got knowing the right people, and then preparation is the fourth P. And what I mean by that is, I find that successful entrepreneurs had some sort of know-how in order to succeed in that thing. For example, I could not right now, as much as I know about business and have been successful in business, couldn't start a biotech firm. I don't have the, pre I don't, I'm not prepared. I don't have the know-how to do it. Uh, like in a like manner, I couldn't necessarily start the empire that you've got with power washing and those types of things because I don't have the know-how to do it where you do. So I'm assuming that the know-how came straight from dad, again, right person and right place and also the person that prepared you for it. But is that is there more to the story than just dad preparing you for this? Um, to some degree, yes. <laughs> there. Uh, so when I was... So I started working for my dad. My dad wasn't a contract cleaner when I started working for him. He was actually a distributor selling power wash products and repairing power wash equipment. And when I was in ninth grade, he, of course, and I resisted in ninth grade, <laughs> this concept was that I had to go learn the family business because it's what he did and it was his obligation to teach me the family business. So I spent four years fixing power washers. So I understood how to repair a power washer before I ever stepped foot on my first contract cleaning job. And he, 
I think the first job I got was from a lead that came into his office. And after that, it was all on me. Uh-huh. So <laughs> that's what all started. Of course, he told me I could have that power washer if I got enough work and that kind of stuff. But um, the, the background and understanding how to fix equipment, I thought was very important, at least for me, because you know, I, I understood that once I got onto a job site, getting that job site finished and completed was very important because I started keeping track of like, well, going into college in, in economics, then it was like all this stuff was clicking like, hey, I need to be making so much when I'm on a job. And, and if I wash this way and use this technique, I get more efficient because I mean, one of the economics classes about how this bricklayer came up with all these processes that were 18 and reduced it to like three, whatever it was for laying bricks. And I started thinking, hey, how can I do that with power washing? And how can I start thinking about how to be more efficient in my power washing process when I clean trucks? So <clears throat> that, those things there, but he, he was definitely a key indicator in giving me guidance as I went through it. So, so yeah, that was preparing. And if, if, I, if I hadn't had that support, going into doing fleet washing and his guidance and helping me pick the right jobs, it, it would have been very difficult because there were, there were several times that I got frustrated with having to, with, with doing fleet washing and, and having to work every weekend while I went to school during the week and miss out on the fun my friends were having. But, um, and I tried to do some other stuff, but it, 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 eventually I realized like, no, it's fleet washing. This is what's made me successful. This is where I've been. And um, I remember a quote from Donald Trump that he had invested in the oil and gas industry one time and he lost his shirt in it. And he goes, you know what I know is real estate and I need to stick to real estate. <laughs> so it always stuck with me. Hey, I need to stick to fleet washing. And it's why I've never given it up or like sold off on it because it's what I really, really know. And you've got other businesses besides uh, fleet washing too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. Tell us about those. Yep. So we got a kitchen exhaust cleaning business where we go into restaurants, commercial establishments that do cooking for the public or for their staff. And we clean their hoods that get uh, laden with grease. What happens is when they cook, that grease atomizes and becomes a vapor. It goes up into the duct. And when the duct cool with the cool air or siding in the duct, that solidifies and precipitates onto the side of the duct collects grease and the grease is a fire hazard so we go in and remove the grease and reduce the risk of fire because there's no longer a fuel to start a fire that's the three sides of the triangle for a fire is you need oxygen ignition and fuel so we remove the fuel and you no longer can have a fire all right so fleet washing you got kitchen exhaust cleaning what else and then there's the uh, power wash dis distribution or, or supplies and manufacturing, which my dad <clears throat> was still doing that when I was growing my business. And in 2010 is when I bought him out and took over that business and then rebranded with powerwash.com, which on my dad's, I'm a, I like being able to reference him a lot, um, had the foresight to realize, and he, he loved to use this example about the railroads and cities uh, that he grew up in, in, in rural Oklahoma, in a little town called Quinlan. And the railroad was coming through, and at that time, Quinlan was a big town. And the forefathers, or the, the leaders of the town, decided they didn't want the railroad coming through the town because it would bring uh, a, a lot of lo loitering and drinking and stuff like that would follow the railroad. So they didn't want the railroad there. And so they made the railroad bypass the town, and the town died because where the railroad went is where commerce went. And so they lost, the town died off over time. And so he saw the internet as a opportunity of growth. And so he went and got several good domain names early on and got mine, steamway.com, for my uh, truck washing business. And he got powerwash.com, he got pressurewash.com, and he got a bunch of others. Um, and so I rebranded powerwash.com when I took over. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's great. So you've got the, the fleet washing, the exhaust cleaning, you've got the power wash and pressurewash.com. Anything else? Power wash university. Power wash. <laughs> so, so he was, 
So that's the part where I'm carrying on, I think, or I feel like mostly what he started into the second generation, whereas the truck washing and fleet washing, even though he he had really not so much on the kitchen exhaust cleaning side, I didn't really have any background there, but he did with the fleet washing. Um, I didn't take over businesses from him with those. I grew both those businesses from, from scratch for the most part. Whereas with PowerWash.com, that was an established business and he was doing training. And so he was the leader in the industry of power, in the power washing industry for training other companies how to do power washing. And so I rebranded that school, Power Wash University, for training guys how to do power washing and helping them grow their business and teaching their techs and things like that. That's great. So that's powerwashu.com or powerwashuniversity.com. Is that yeah. right? Uh-huh. Go either, either one of those places. So if, so if anybody's out there as an entrepreneur that wants to learn more about how to do that industry, is that, is that what that's designed for? To yes, it is. How to do it. Yep. What about somebody like me who I just have a pressure washer and I use it every spring to clean my patio around the pool? <laughs> <laughs> is that helpful? <laughs> yeah. I, I actually think, and, and a lot of, and there's, so when, when I was in college, and I'll never forget the moment when I was driving down the road and I saw this uh, painting truck drive past me. And I looked at that painting truck and I says, I can see where our industry's going. One day, power washing contractors are going to be like painting contractors. They're going to be everywhere. And there's so many people getting into the industry now. Um, and you can get a, it's the same. You can go down and get all your painting supplies at Home Depot. You can get all your power washing supplies at Home Depot. It's not the same quality as what we would provide, but it's, it's, it's enough to be able to get into it. And at first I felt like it was going to destroy our industry because homeowners and whatnot would want to start doing it. But I think just the opposite has happened. It's actually created a lot of awareness for what can be done with a power washer. And when guys like yourself go there to do the back patio or do around the pool deck or clean their driveway, and it takes them all day. And they're like, eh, I wonder what it would charge, what it get for me to get a contractor out here to do this. And so it's created a lot of opportunity. And so there's these guys going out there and they're getting equipment that can do it fast. For instance, you would probably take all day with the stuff you would get from. Oh from yeah, Depot. for sure. Yeah. Whereas a guy would buy equipment with us. It's commercial grade. It's, it's, we teach them the techniques. They could stop at a house and probably do it in an hour, maybe two hours tops. And so, it's a win-win situation for both parties. So it works out great. Well, uh, so this is interesting that we bring this up. I'm going to get a little selfish on the show here because this is my show, so I get to ask these questions. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I've, got, I've got a PVC three-rail fence all around my property. I've got seven and a half acres, and the fence gets nasty, like, like the yes. hackberry trees and the yeah. mold. And so I got out there one time, and I, I spent like a week – Pressure washing. It looks fantastic and very satisfying. When you pressure wash a white fence and you get it yeah. clean, it's very satisfying. Well, I did it. It was fine. Uh, looked great for about a month. And then it went back. So the, just the other day, the reason the reason I thought about this, not only did you mention something that made me think of it, just the other day, the uh, the company that does all my landscaping work, they, they also, I think they subcontract, I'm not sure how they do it, but they subcontract a pressure washing. And the guy... My, my main guy for my landscape crew said, hey, do you want us to look at doing your fence? And my first thing that I said was, no, because it only lasts a month. So is there something that I don't know about what a pressure washing company would do to make that last more than a month? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not. I mean, because it's, it has, it's, it's an algae or potentially some, uh, not really, it's usually not mold, but a lot of people think it's a mold, it's an algae that grows on there is to put some kind of uh, algicide or something on there to slow it down. But eventually that's going to wear off and it's going to grow back. But um, not really. There's not, there's <laughs> not a trick to keeping it from not coming back. Yeah. Well, that's why I said I don't, I don't want to pay anybody else to do it. I'll, I'll either do it or just leave it dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I, uh, I appreciate this because what we're seeing here is that there's passion, a purpose behind what you're doing, which I love. And then and then the second P is, is being in the right place at the right time. And I think your dad – ending up in Fort Worth right there th- between the north and south corridors and east and west corridor, like perfect yeah. spot. And then knowing the right people, your dad was the right person that, to help you get their preparation. You learned that through the years of doing all of your selling mistletoe and chewing gum and fireworks 
prepared you for today where you're 35 years in the business and doing a killer, killer business. So the last, the last P is plan. And a lot of times when I talk about this to people that don't know kind of where I'm coming from, they'll assume that I mean written business plan. And while that can be something important, what I'm finding is that most entrepreneurs that are super successful don't have written business plans. That, that, that's, that's not true 100% of the time. There are exceptions. The last guest I had on the podcast had a written business plan, and he was super, super successful. So um, what I really mean by plan, Michael, is the ability to obtain and deploy financial resources. So when you start a company, you've got to have a plan to do that because you know, you can have any kind of idea in the world. It could be a million dollar idea, but if you don't have a plan to execute that with financial resources, it's, it's worthless. So how did, what plan did you have coming out of college, high school, whatever, when you started your business? What was your plan for the financial resources required to build the business? There wasn't a lot. <laughs> I mean, honestly, there wasn't. I, uh, I just, I was just very frugal with my money and I would take the profit I made and I invested it back into the money, <laughs> back into the company, not the money. So I just kept, when it, it, the company always came first to make it successful and to make sure I had good equipment and that I was upgrading uh, the trucks and the trailers and things like that. And I started off early on. I started off with like old trucks and things like that. And I learned after about 15 years that buying an old truck that needed a lot of repairs was costing me way more <laughs> than what it would be to have a brand new truck that was reliable. And we could be, you know, a good service for our customers because we weren't having breakdowns and I wasn't wasting time because the trucks were breaking down. So I just, I just focused a lot on building the bank account off the profit and then reinvesting that back into the company. I never really had anyone that was investing in the company to help me grow it. So I grew it that way from the ground up and just lived a frugal lifestyle and, and just, or if you want to call it stoic lifestyle, I did that. Uh, I didn't even realize what stoic, stoic was until later in life. Um, but I came by it naturally, so I, I, that's just what I did. And, and I actually learned that from my grandfather on my mom's side. I mean, he was very frugal, grew up in the Depression. That's kind of what I was going to say earlier about how he influenced me was with his hard work ethic and being very frugal in how he spent. Yeah, wow. So I think what's interesting when you say, well, I didn't really have one plan. I, I, if somebody had asked me that a few years ago about, about my success as an entrepreneur, I would have said the same thing. But, but once you analyze, okay, well, how did I get the resources to do it? You can go back and go, oh, that's how I did it. And so it was so second nature to you to use your existing relationships and contracts and contacts and, and resources that you had that it wasn't a written plan, but like, had you not had any of that, you couldn't have been successful. Like if somebody wanted to start a, a somebody want to start your business today, like you teach a lot of people at Power Wash University who want to start these businesses. But if they don't have a plan to get resources and buy their equipment, th th it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're a very, very right. So my dad, my dad was a good influence business-wise on how, how to help run the business and stuff. Then my grandfather was a good person that helped me with personal relationships and that kind of stuff and influence there. And then I actually um, had a great resource with the staff that worked for my dad because of their understanding of, of power washing equipment and what customers would come in and share with them. And I would get those ideas on how to do jobs and how to apply things and what, what my dad had done before too was always a resource for me to reach out to. So kind of the, I guess the mentor type side of the, the planning is what you're talking about there. So yeah, yeah I hadn't really thought about it like that. Well, you, but yeah. yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a conscious decision, but you look back and go, Oh, well, that's how I did it. And, and if you're going to train somebody in power wash university today, you're, you're going to tell them, Hey, you got to have a plan to get some money because you got to be able to buy the equipment and you got to hire employees and you got to get your licenses and certifications. So tell, talk as we kind of finish the conversation, kind of talk a little bit about, Power Wash University, because I know that's big for you right now, and that's what you're trying to kind of let people know, that there's a great opportunity there to learn how to do this business and do it well from somebody who's doing, 
you know, a lot of money, a lot of money annually and revenue on this, yeah. this concept. So talk a little bit about Power Wash U. Yeah. Power Wash U, uh, like I said, my dad started years ago and, um, I, I smile. So I got to tell why I'm smiling since I smiled. He posted a video that I did in 1992 when he first started doing training. And it's me walking in with a briefcase, opening up this briefcase and pulling out my presentation and being real, um, uh, because I was in college, very uh, professorous uh-huh. uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> with the presentation, which you don't see much of today. And I don't even, I even had on a suit jacket and stuff. So I was like, <laughs> no one really does that in the power washing industry now. But um, Power Wash University, we have, we have online training and we also have hands-on training. So we, we try to give the, those that you know, can't really travel or aren't able to travel or don't want to travel for whatever reason, a way to be able to do some online training. And then what I do find, and and this is very prominent, I think, with a lot of people is that even though they can see how to do it, and even though they can have the materials on how to do it, they they lack the confidence to go out and start doing it because they're afraid they're going to make a mistake and they really want to do a little hands-on. So we also have the hands-on training so people can come to our schools. We take them out in the field. We put them on actual jobs and we we just walk them right through the whole process and say, watch out for this, look at that. And even if they've taken the schooling or the, the the, the classroom stuff or the online and seeing that they still want to go out to a job site and just go through it to build that confidence, to go out and actually do it effectively for, the customers that they're they're going to try to go after and and I get that because because when I started <laughs> I really I really didn't have that opportunity to go do any kind of hands on and so I was like I I can do this I can do that I can do that how long do I think it'll take me this is what I need to charge and a lot of times if I broke even on a first time type of project I was lucky and there were several times that I lost money but I was like you know what I've got the experience now so yeah. next time I can use what I learned here and I can actually be profitable on it. Well, so how can people get in touch with you? Is it just through Power Wash University or are there other ways you'd like people to get in touch with you? Um, they, they could actually email me if they wanted to. They could hit me at michael.hinderleiter at steamway.com. That's the main email address that I use. All right. So let's spell that because yeah. people are listening. So it's Michael, traditional spelling of Michael, dot. Hinderleiter. Hinderleiter. And I'll let you spell it. Yeah. It's H-I-N-D-E-R-L-I-T-E-R. All right, there you go. Michael Hinderleiter. Michael.Hinderleiter at steamaway.com, which is S-T-E-A-M-A-W-A-Y.com. All right, so they can email you. They can go to powerwashu.com. What else? Any other uh, social media? Powerwash.com. Okay. So it's 1-877-P-W-U-O-R-C-A, which is ORCA, which is the mascot of Power Wash University. And that's Power Wash U, the letter U, like university. So PowerWashU.com, right? That's correct. All right. Anything, like, here's kind of the last question I want to ask you as we close it out. If you, if you had a brand new entrepreneur who wants to get in the business, like he or she is itching, they've, they seem to be passionate about it, willing to suffer for it, they've got all these other things, right place, right time, all the things we just talked about. What are the pieces of advice, one or two pieces that you would say, hey, do this or pay attention to this? I would... I would say that the first six months to a year, the, the guy getting into it early on is going to pay a lot of attention to the technical side of doing power washing. But if you want to advance past that and grow your business and become large, you really need to become focused on how to develop your management skills. Now, there are those that come into the industry with good management skills right from the beginning. And so they, they just manage and they hire technicians to do the work and they get the technicians trained. And I know guys that to this day, they've been in 10 or 15 years and they still don't know how to do a lot of the power washing themselves. They just manage and run the business because they find that our service can help them train their techs and get them going. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but, and then there's guys that do it for years and they really don't want to grow. They're not. And I, I understand why they don't because there's frustration. Uh, when it comes to managing and running employees and where there are, and this is going to sound kind of snotty-ish, I guess, if you want to say that, but if, 
if you really want to be successful with this and, and, and grow to that level, you have to step out of your comfort zone and really learn how to start managing people and delegating and becoming a good employer um, for, for growing a company. It's just, it's just what it takes. And if you're, if you're not driven with that to, to, to take it to wherever your purpose may be, because that may not satisfy that end goal purpose, because again, the company's great and, and the industry's great. And it's, it's, it's really, there's a lot of different aspects there too. Um, you just, you, you've got to be, you've got to understand how to be a manager yeah. more than anything. That's what it comes down to. You can be an owner operator. So let me back up a little bit, just a little bit. The, the thing about power washing that's so good is that there's so many different levels within the industry that you can be in. You can be the owner operator and be that forever. You can be the guy that gets up to one or two trucks because most people are in a, are easily within a comfort zone for one or two trucks. It's when you hit that third or fourth truck that it becomes difficult to grow to five and six. But if you get past the third or fourth truck and get to five or six and more, the bottom line grows substantially. And it grows more than what happens at the third or fourth truck because the third or fourth truck is where inefficiencies take place and you're learning to manage better and you're learning how to be a better company. Uh, uh, so let me see, a more efficient company and putting processes and systems in place is there. So moving, pushing sales hard enough to grow past the third or fourth truck and become profitable is super important at that phase if you want to get big. Yeah, and I, I would imagine that that level of expertise and knowing that only comes from knowing this for 35 years. And so if you want to learn how to do this, Power Wash University is the place you need to go to learn how to do it. Because that little tip, like I wouldn't have known that, like going from one to two is one thing, going from three to five is another. Like people need to know that. So thank you. Michael, it's been an honor to talk to you. And, and yeah, honestly, I like talking to somebody who started out selling mistletoe <laughs> in second grade to building a $10 million business. is uh, It's an honor to get to know you. Thank yeah. you for being here today. I appreciate that. And so for everybody that's watching and listening, you know, there you have it. My, my theory of these five Ps, these five indisputable keys to success stands because just like in Michael's story, there's this passion that drives him to purpose to, to accomplish these things and then be in the right place, right time, knowing the right people, the preparation that he had, even from a kid learning how to sell, you know, bubble gum and chewing gum at the skating rink, whatever, and fireworks, building a fireworks stand, all these things prepared him for tremendous success that he's experiencing today and will continue to experience because he's built his business in a way where he's not having to be there every single day. So if you want to know your probability of success, you're an entrepreneur, you're like, how would I know if I'm going to succeed at this thing that I'm attempting to do? Well, I want you to take the five P's of success assessment. It's completely free. Go to the five P's of success.com. That's the five P's of success. And it's the number five in the letter P S the five P's of success.com. And you could take a 17 question assessment. It's very simple. And at the end of that, it'll give you a report and it'll show specifically, Hey, based on the way you answered these questions, your probability of success is high as low as medium, whatever it is. And it'll give you some examples of what you might want to do to increase your probability of success. And I know that as an entrepreneur myself, and I know that Michael probably can say the same thing, you know, knowing our probability of success early on would have helped a lot because we'd have made better decisions. We would have taken more risk. We would have done the things that we needed to do to get to success faster, which is why I designed that assessment. Go, so go to the five P's of success.com and take that. It's completely free. Or you can even go to my website at the real slash success. You can get to the assessment either place. If you don't follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn, please go do that. I'm at the real Jason Duncan. I would love to connect with you there. Send me a direct message and let me know you heard this. And if you haven't left a, uh, a review on iTunes or something, I, I appreciate it. If you'd go do that at Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you listen to it, be great. And make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube and hit the bell icon. So you'll know the next time we release one of our episodes. So until next time, when I talk with yet another amazingly successful entrepreneur about how they got to success on the root of all success, remember this, Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit the root of all to access the show notes and other helpful resources. 
Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.